Hello everybody, welcome back, Graham here. Thank you for joining me, and again, thank you for all the messages I'm being, uh, I've received, it's so, so appreciated, and um, thank you. So today I'm, I'm talking about how we planned for that MRI, and when the appointment came through, and how I felt. Now, the appointment came through quite quickly, probably about a week to 10 days after I'd come back from the biopsy. Um, and we were starting to take in all the information. Again, I was out there researching as well. I was always looking for information about what other people were experiencing. And believe me, there was not a lot out there. You know, the, there was not I couldn't find many, many people who were talking, talking their way through their process. There was, in fact, there was nobody there. There was just um, an odd editorial. There's lots of information about what prostate cancer was and what it does and, and how to, you know, what level you can, you know, you can be diagnosed at. But there was nothing, there was no one doing an editorial where, or a diary like I'm doing. To, to explain their mental health. You know, a diagnosis is one thing, but the mental health side of it is completely different. And that's why, you know, you have so much support through the NHS system. Um, now, again, I, I talked in the last one that it was always readily available to me if I needed it. And, and the Macmillan support team was there 24-7. I just, you know, rang up, left the message, and they got back to me. Uh, but some of the things that I... Well, well, some of the support network that was out there, I became a little bit... Um, I guess not skeptical, but I just didn't want to take myself into that process. I mean, I'm 58 and a lot of the people there were, you know, in their late sixties and I didn't feel compelled to go and tell my story or join in on the group sessions. Um, and I don't know if that was right or wrong, you know? So I, I, I went back to the internet to find out or find if there was a, a person out there talking their, you know, their, their personal diaries of what happened. And I couldn't find anyone. Um, there was one or two guys who were talking about um, being diagnosed and that was it. But there was no one telling a story through the journey of it. And that is probably one of the main reasons I, I decided to do these diaries. I wanted it out there that people could could look at and then say, or make a comparison and say, that part of the journey he's going through, I can compare it with Graham's journey. And that made me feel really quite good about that because you do compare yourself or you compare a situation in life with what information is out there. And that's what I did. Uh, so going back to the preparation of the MRI, we were, we were a little bit worried and my wife, you know, was she admit she was terrified inside. And it was something we, we were going together and all the doubts were swirling around in my head and I'm sure it was happening to her as well. But the end result, we stayed positive. And that's, I, I implore everyone, try your absolute utmost to stay positive. Stay focused in your head. Uh, if you've got a full-time job, if you've got, you know, children to look after, the home, the, you know, I'm fortunate, I'm a stay-at-home dad and my wife goes down to work. So, 
her working distracts her, my home life and looking after the uh, my youngest distracts me an awful lot. But they do creep in, you know, when you have that 10 minutes sit down or, you know, you stop and think about what's happening to you, it creeps back in. But, you know, you deal with it one way or another. So the MRI, we, um, we got the appointment through and the closer it came, I guess the more I just wanted it to be over. I wanted now to have that diagnosis, whether it is one way or it was the other. I just wanted to have it and I wanted to have all the information and say, okay, there's no more waiting, there's no more wondering and this is my diagnosis and now I'm going through that treatment plan or I'm going a different way and I'll be told that through my cancer specialist. Um, we went up to the hospital and it was quite a late appointment, it was in the evening and I got there, got changed, I knew the routine and it was a 25 minute procedure. Um, now if you know, it's a magnetic field what is run through backwards and forwards. And look it up. I'm not going to go into the detail what an MRI scan is, but it's all out there if you want to know. But all I can remember was lying on that table and it was the noisiest thing. And they do warn you, you know, they, they actually even say, put, put these earphones on, you know, because it's going to be very, very loud. And I remember all I wanted to do was cough had this bit of a cold or something in my throat was not right and I was lying on this table it was quite cold gown on and the noise level if you've ever had one you know you, you can probably tell me yes I don't know what decibels it goes but it was incredibly loud and it just seemed to go on forever and I just was trying to hold back me coughing because you have to really try and stay still. And you have you just try and, you know, refocus on something else and other thoughts coming into your head. But the, the noise, it, it just was the dominant thing. It, it was, that was all you could focus on. And, uh, you know, I just wanted it over. And I keep on going back to it. I just, Sat, lay on that table going what what if what if this what if that and, and the other side was saying look just wait till you get all the information and then we'll take it from there and that was always that was like my wife's voice what was in my head because that's what she constantly said we can't make any decisions over and above what we've already made until we've got all that information and when it finished, the people doing the, um, carrying out the, the scan, lovely people, um, didn't tell me anything really. It was, there was nothing they could tell me. You know, they go off, process the information, and then it will be another conversation with um, the senior consultant. Um, and that would be then, you know, draw the line and this is where we proceed. Which way do we go that way or that way? And uh, it was, I keep on saying this, plan for the worst and hope for the best. And it took me, you know, probably another, I think it was another two, three weeks. Um, and then the conversation came about but anyway I hope you're all enjoying this and anyone who's listening and can draw comparisons to what their journey is drop me a line anyone who's going through a journey good luck and I'm wishing you health the best of health um, hope you're enjoying it and I'll see you on the next episode bye for now
Hello everybody, welcome back, episode 13. So, just going through the last couple of episodes and we were very much building up to the MRI scan and um, talking to the wife very much about what's going to happen if it was in the bone and that was specifically why we were having the MRI scan. So through other scans and other biopsies we were already built that picture up of what was happening. The cancer had made its way out of the prostate. It was affecting other areas but the concern was very much about it was literally on the bone. So the MRI would give the answers as to how aggressive this cancer was and we'd already established it was a 3, 3.5. So we had the confirmation of the booking. I went up to the hospital, had the scan and I'm just going to come right out with it a few days later and I can't remember if it was a specific phone call from my cancer specialist or I had written confirmation. The results were that it hadn't, hadn't gone into the bone. Now, the relief that I felt was undescribable because it sent me in a direction from I believe I was going and it slammed the brakes on and turned a different way and it was very much about now I could start to take on that very positive role albeit I, I was already positive but I still had the unanswered question because once it's in the bone you know, you have um, a completely different treatment plan. So now the confirmation had been given to us. And I remember, you know, I, I, I phoned my wife. First person I phoned was my wife and she was at work, bless her. And I told her it wasn't in the bone. And all I can remember her was breaking down in tears. Now, to hear your wife break down in tears is, is something, it's, a, it's an overwhelming sense of love for another person. Because all you want to do is go and hold that person and say, it's okay, it's going to be all right, everything's now on the right course. Although you still have a huge journey to go. I mean, that, they call it a journey because it is a journey. But it's a journey that you're in control of now. Obviously, with your treatment plan, with the other things that were coming up. You know, don't, don't get me wrong. You, you still have cancer and they still have to manage that cancer. Um, but it's another step what was in the right direction. So my wife, bless her, you know, that outpouring of emotion or relief um, was part of the healing process as well for us because we both had gone through this absolute roller coaster since the diagnosis in early summer and bear in mind we've moved forward three months and now we had that release of it's not in the bone. We literally switched over into now focusing on what the future, you know, was going to be. And that future was very much about the treatment plan, the testosterone blockers. Now, after the testosterone blockers were reducing the cancer or putting it in, suppressing it and putting it into a dormant state. 
it will then be radiotherapy. Now that's a whole different journey, you know, and that wasn't going to be until, you know, at the earliest, January. Um, so the realistic approach to this was now we could plan. You know, we were going to make things become a positive rather than a negative. Yes, we had, I still had the cancer, but it was again now moving past that, you know, possible terminal state into now just let's get on with it. We know what the testosterone is going to do. We know that the radiotherapy is going to be like, and we know we're going to have to, or I'm going to have to keep on with these testosterone blockers for a further, you know, two, three years, you know, even longer, because it was a very aggressive cancer. Um, it hadn't been removed or it wouldn't be removed. Um, the prostate wasn't going to be removed. So the only option I had was to go through that quite lengthy process of suppressing the cancer, reducing it, and making sure that the radiotherapy can target the cancer and kill off as much as possible. So anyway, the, the whole relief had now, you know, come across as I told my oldest son, you know, he, he's at university and I didn't want to disrupt his studies, uh, but he was relieved and um, he dealt with it the way he deals. My youngest, you know, we hadn't fully explained what was going on, but he knew dad was going up to the hospital and doing certain things. Um, and we told a few other people and that was it. We were still very much in that, you know, process of just telling a small circle of people. So I'm not going to go too much into what came next. Um, we'll leave that to the next one. But thank you for joining me. It's always a great pleasure to tell this story. And I hope people are being able to make a little comparison to what my journey is and to what their journey is. So thanks again. Bye for now. And I'll see you on episode 14. Bye bye. Hello everybody, welcome back, Graham here, episode 14, and we're going to move forward to how I started to make myself or my mental health a lot more in line with what was going on um, after the diagnosis and obviously after what happened with the MRI and the diagnosis of it wasn't in the bone so as i said last time we were relieved and we moved forward um and i had focus refocused myself on now coming to terms with what the cap cancer represented how it was going to be treated and what the side effects were um, with the testosterone blockers now, in previous episode, I'd already started talking talk to you about the blockers and what they were doing to me um, in the tablet form. 
Now the sound effects is very much um, hot flushes, um, fatigue, um, and generally feeling very heavy. I felt also really, really heavy in my legs all the time. Because what happens is you are actually suppressing your testosterone and you start to have, um, how, how can I best describe it? You start to have wasting in your muscles because you aren't physically active or you have that fatigue. You, you have a, a, d a degree of muscle loss and that's, you know, whether it's in your legs, whether it's in your arms or whether it's just generally, you, you, your body starts to change. Now, mine changed um, because I wasn't active. Um, one of the big side effects that I came across was I started to put weight on in my midsection uh, and my chest started to develop breasts. Now, for a man, that is quite a big deal to deal with your body changing um, and it's not a pleasant thing to go through now I there are there's plenty of information to help you combat those side effects but how can you when you you just have heavy fatigue on you and you know, and you, these things are happening you know every day the same symptoms were coming back every day and one of the one of the big ones I had was sleep deprivation. I was waking up two or three times in the night, getting up, going to the toilet, coming back, trying to go back to sleep. So I was operating uh, with a you know probably about. 30-40% of what I could usually act, you know, op operate on on a daily basis before. And that's sleep deprivation. And sleep deprivation is, is a big issue. Because if you're not, if you're waking up not feeling rested, and then still going through that day, and still having to carry out everything you do, you know, you start to wear down. And that can be compounded with the heaviness I felt in my legs, the changing of my body, you know, the, the just feeling really, really bad. Now, to the point where I actually went to the doctors and I said, look, you've got to help me with some of this, these side effects. And that conversation I had with him um, was very much, and I think I've mentioned this before, he, he came, it's, he said back to me, he said, Graham, you, you, there's a massive war going on in your body. You know, and you're, of course you're going to feel these things. And, and I said, well, I, I, I'm struggling to operate like this. And he gave me some pretty strong um, tablets and they were, they were coding. And that helped. That just took the edge off things, because boy, if if that hadn't happened, I would, I would have really been struggling, you know. And I, I'm not one for, you know, going to the doctors and complaining about this or complaining about that. But it, it was just so heavy for me. And to to this day, I am still waking up two, three times a night, going to the toilets, feeling heavy in the legs, you know, wasting of the muscle, fatigue. But it's all now a lot more manageable because um, I know, and, and I think I can put it down to this, is that this journey, as month and month and month go by, I get a little bit back of myself now whether you can determine that's a feeling of um, you feeling better 
having a little bit more energy every day or knowing that you know that light in the end of the tunnel is becoming a little bit brighter as every month goes by now bear in mind i i still have uh, a huge shot of testosterone blocker injected into me every three months so i'm i'm very much like this you know i i go up and down but i i'm always on the positive side of it um because to me you know the worst was over you know i i had a very clear um way forward and that was just supported by everything Macmillan and everything my cancer specialist was offering. So you guys out there who are going through this journey, you know, there are stages of the, and I said this at the very beginning, there's ups and downs everywhere you turn with this. But if you're talking about it, and you're expressing it, you're healing on every single day. Because that's how I found I could deal with it. You know, I, I wasn't looking for sympathy. I wasn't looking for, you know, oh, I'm, I've got cancer. You know, it's a horrible thing. It really is, but you can't give up. You can't give in. It's, you know, your life, you live your life every single day. Yeah? And you have to live it in a way that you want to feel good about it, you know? Anyway, that's a little bit about what the uh, my emotional state was and also my mental health was. Um, but as you can see now th going through these journeys with me, these diaries, you can see everything was now pointing in the direction of me dealing with it in a positive way or sorry should i say dealing with the side effects and the treatment plan in a positive way because that's what it was anyway thank you for joining me i'll see you next time and bye for now Hello everybody, welcome back, Graham here. Welcome to episode 15. Now, I, um, I just recapped on the last episode and I was very much positive about the outcome of uh, the diagnosis and the treatment plan was in full effect. And I had a discussion with my cancer specialist upon the, you know, the, the results of the MRI and he told me, and I went to the hospital and he, he, the, the head of the department, the professor, um, he sat me down and went through in fine detail of everything I'd actually gone through, through the diagnosis stage. And then in detail told me exactly um, how this cancer was going to be treated. Um, and I've, I've detailed a lot of it through the diaries, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about how he explained through the HD of the, the pictures from the scans, how he was attack, going to attack through now the radiotherapy. And he was... He was really quite detailed and very precise 
and how he was going to target the prostate through the radiotherapy and reduce, reduce and reduce through the testosterone blockers, the cancer. And that was starving any means of this, test, this cancer growing. And once it was reduced to the size that they could then target through the radiotherapy, a large part of the battle would be then be won. Now, before I could have the radiotherapy, I was explained that the testosterone blocks had to keep on suppressing the cancer and reducing it. And my PSA would have to be back into the realms of normal, or not normal, but reduced to the point where there was a very successful outcome through the radiotherapy. And it really gave me a lot of food for thoughts on, oh, not just me, but, and, you know, the, the center was full of different people having, you know, a diagnosis or a, a discussion of how their treatment plan was moving forward. And I remember looking around in the waiting room before I went in and there was, there was a, a good dozen people, all older than me, a lot older than me, but they were all going through different stages of their cancer. And I remember coming out of there and, and with a, quite a smile and it was late into autumn and I was thinking, let's just get to, to that radiotherapy stage. And I didn't know if it was going to be early January or late January. And um, it was just one of those things that we're working towards. And we got home and my wife was again jubilant and very positive about how we're moving forward. But it didn't detract away from, you know, again, all these side effects I was having. It was just another layer of being told exactly what had happened, what was currently going on, and when I was where I was moving to next. And the only thing I remember of all these discussions was, I'm just so looking forward to Christmas. And it was, we were literally knocking on the door of Christmas. And my, my household, I, I do a lot of the planning, I do all the cooking, I, I gather all the, the presents and wrap them and plan for Christmas and the menus and because that's the role I take, I took on, you know, and I had done for many, many years. I, I was always the one who was, you know, processing Christmas in the way everyone loved to process Christmas through our household. And on my back of my mind is, it, it yes, I was looking forward to it, but I really didn't have the energy for it. And no one who's watching this and is, is going through this stage with me or on a, a different stage of their journey, you know, I'm sure you can relate back and go, yep, I didn't have the enthusiasm as I previous years or I wasn't really up to the challenge again. You know, because you are living side by side with cancer. You know, you can't just forget about it. You can't just say, oh, well, you know, um, this is the journey, but I've got everything back what I was before. You haven't, you know, you are living with it on a daily basis. And I, and I wasn't going to give in and say, well, we're going to have a much more, you know, diluted Christmas. I still wanted the boys home, enjoying unwrapping their Christmas presents, me cooking the turkey, the gammon, 
all the things that we've always traditionally done. You know, having family members over, it was, it was my little personal journey that I wasn't going to give in to. Uh, she's, you know, I'd stopped drinking, having a, a little drink, you know, years before. So it wasn't something I was going to miss by not having a drink. And I don't think I'd even have a drink because that would send me to sleep straight away. But we did have one um, a family member who'd come over from, you know, Nottingham and we'd always traditionally have a few drinks together and would plan what we were going to have and would cook. And I'll just quickly tell you the story. I, I did have a drink on that occasion, on that day, and it just sent me into, like, I'd lost everything, all the energy, and I was halfway through cooking and preparing the meal, and I had to say to my sister, I said, please, can you take over, because I couldn't do it. I was absolutely, you know, not wasted or anything like that, not, I wasn't drunk, I was just, the energy just literally drained out of me, maybe because I'd relaxed, and I, it was only one gin and tonic, I remember, but I'd relaxed and just couldn't carry on. I was just listening to everybody talking, but I just didn't have the energy to carry on and put everything on the plate. And I remember we cooked a, an amazing lamb dinner. Um, and we'd stir, you know, lamb with all the uh, roasted lamb, mint jelly, you know, prepared with garlic and all these other things and rosemary. Uh, and we decided to have it with mashed potato, with mustard and lamb gravy. And it was absolutely delicious. But I just couldn't get to the point of finishing it off with the mashed potato. So, you know, good on you, Karen, and uh, well done for finishing it off. But we had a wonderful time on that occasion. Um, and these little memories that I look back on and don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm still going through exactly the same processes, but I've dealt with it in a much more methodical way, rather than be in a reactive state all the time. I plan through, I know where my limitations are now. So if you're going through it, plan that way. You know, know what the restrictions are, know what your limitations are, and don't try and overcompensate anything this treatment plan I'm going through is 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 a lifesaver absolutely 100% a lifesaver but it is a journey and it has to be treated like that anyway thank you for joining me um, it's an absolute honor um, so see you next time and thanks again for joining me bye bye Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode, Graham here. Listen, thank you everybody who's been commenting, who's giving very positive feedback. It's wonderful to hear. I will get back to people who are writing to me personally. Thank you again. Listen, um, just a quick shout out to a guy who is doing a, a blog called fighting through cancer he uh, I watched an episode of his and he was doing a bit about side effects of 
the injections, the hormone injections he's having, what we call the prostate blockers, um, testosterone blockers. And he came out with some really jarring issues that he was having. And I could make that comparison because I'm actually, I mean, I'm sure we're all having the same, but he was having some quite a horrific um, side effects. Um, hot flushes, you know, the tiredness, the fatigue, um, the body changing. But he was, he, he had the side effects which was much more apparent on his emotional state. I mean, he was saying that he could walk through a shop, something would trigger an emotion and he would just, you know, start to well up or cry. You know, I don't have any of that, but I have other quite extreme ones. But bear in mind, you know, he he was stage four. Um, but I just wanted to mention, you know, his blog is really good. Um, very down to earth, down to the truth. And a good shout out to him. You know, I will connect to him and I will um, drop him a line. So I was just going through some of the episodes I've done since the uh, channel started. As you know, I do a cooking side, but also I've started to um, post weekly poems. And the poems are very much in line with my journey and going through that journey. So if you enjoy some nice words, it's only about a minute and a half long, but tune in and have a look at that. It's really good. Um, yeah, as I was saying, I was, I've gone back over some of the episodes and it dawned on me, wow, what a journey this has been. You know, and I've, I must admit, I feel so much better now. I'm starting to feel like I'm, I've got an opinion. I've got a voice. Um, I'm telling my story. People are listening. And, you know, as you know, one in seven men go through some sort of prostate cancer in their lives. Now, that's a truly astounding statistic. Um, wow. But on the good side, we get through it or we're getting through it. It's just a journey that we're having to go through. And, and I'm particularly going through it and telling the story because it makes me feel like I have a voice again and, you know, I'm contributing to something. <clears throat> so, I, I just wanted to talk about my first Christmas going through, you know, with the diagnosis of prostate cancer. And in the last couple of episodes, I talked about going through the final diagnosis stage having the MRI, uh, being told it wasn't in the bone, you know, um, going through the emotional state, understanding what my treatment plan was going to be and how I was going to deal with it. Um, <clears throat> and really, the, the whole emphasis of your treatment is about suppressing that cancer, and stopping it growing in the prostate, or spreading even, to allow you to get to a stage where your radiotherapy had a very, very good chance of succeeding through a targeting process. Now, I hadn't been told when I was gonna have my radiotherapy. All I was told is, um, take the tablets, I moved from the tablets onto the injections, uh, have my PSA tested every three months, and then when my PSA normalizes or gets to a, 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 a state of where the radiotherapy could be effective or will be effective, and then I'll be told a date. What I was told is it could possibly in, be in January. Um, so I had very positive prognosis and it was now coming to terms, trying to get life back to, you know, a normal keel, 
having the cancer living side by side and dealing with it the best way I knew how to. And that was having a little bit of things to look forward to. Christmas was literally upon us. Um, and my job was very much to gather everything, the presents, and, and make Christmas as special as possible. The only thing I didn't have um, was, the, was the energy levels. And that was purely because the, the blockers um, was doing their job because the side effects of the blockers was fatigue, flushes, um, muscle loss, um, a whole host of other things. But somehow, and I told you in the in the last episode, is I rang the doctor and asked for some help um, because everything I was trying just wasn't working. And he gave me some pretty strong um, painkillers, and that tended to poke me up because I had a coping mechanism of if it got too bad, I could, you know, take these. So we got to Christmas and although my energy levels were low, we had a brilliant time. You know, my family had all gathered. Um, Jacob had come back from university. Morgan was his, you know, normal in, jubilant self, you know, full of enthusiasm, which makes me feel good. And my wife, bless her, you know, she makes Christmas as as special as ever. So we went through Christmas and New Year and that perked me up and made me feel a lot more, I guess, focused for what was coming up. I knew this was coming up quite soon, sooner rather than later. And that was the radiotherapy. Now, before I start going into the radiotherapy, and I'm going to leave that to the next episode because it's quite a bit of a detailed thing. It was in January, late end of January, I got a phone call. Uh, and that was early January, I had my PSA done. Uh, they got the results of that and my bloods came back positive. So it was starting to drop the blockers, the sorry, the tablets, the injections had all started to take effect. And bear in mind, this was going back to, you know, springtime when I was diagnosed. So that was good, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in the next episode. Thanks again for jo- uh, for joining me. I love telling this story. Thanks so much, and I'll see you on the next episode. Bye bye.